Hi, everyone here and around the world. Remember, back in the fall of 2017, there were astronomy headlines from the PanSTARRS telescope in Hawaii that detected the, quote, first interstellar object known to humans, close quote. Interstellar means located among the stars, not bound to a particular sun like we are on Earth. So fall of 2017 is when a muamua, Hawaiian for scout or leader in a battle, shown here in an illustration, became famous as a strange sort of craft-shaped object coming into our solar system. Closest to the sun on September 9th, 2017, traveling at 56,880 miles an hour, and then it changed course rapidly, heading away from Earth at 97,200 miles an hour and continues speeding out of our solar system. European Space Agency astronomer Marco Michelli was surprised that, quote, a muamua was not slowing down as fast as it should have under gravitational forces alone, close quote. An American astronomer, Karen Meech, at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu said, quote, we've never seen interstellar objects pass through our solar system before. Two years later, another interstellar object showed up in fall of 2019 when an amateur astronomer in Crimea named Borisov discovered the first interstellar comet. Shown here at its closest on the left, and farthest on the right, the orbit of the Borisov 21 comet was calculated by the Jet Propulsion Lab in California. JPL confirmed the comet came from somewhere else in our Milky Way galaxy, point of origin unknown. Therefore, this comet was also an interstellar object not bound to our sun and was only the second interstellar object known to humans since Amuamua in 2017. Could there be other interstellar objects that have impacted Earth? One scientist deeply interested in interstellar objects is Harvard University professor of science, Avi Loeb, PhD, who directed Harvard's astronomy department for a decade and is now director of the Institute for Theory and Computation and head of the Galileo Project, both at Harvard. Professor Loeb told me that in January of 2019, he was doing a radio interview when he was asked about a meteor falling near the Bering Sea in December of 2018, but he had not heard of it, and he searched the web for more information. And that's when Professor Loeb found this NASA JPL Center for Near Earth Object Studies that listed a catalog of meteors detected by United States government sensors. There had been 273 such meteor lists over a decade. Professor Loeb asked his undergraduate PhD student, Amir Siraj, to study the meteor list for any recorded velocity moving faster than escape speed from our solar system. And that NASA catalog of bolide events is where Professor Avi Loeb and Amir Siraj found this near-Earth object catalog reference to a 2014 meteor that might be interstellar. Quote, it says, point 45 meter meteor detected at 2014-01-08, which means January 8th, 2014, at 17.05.34 UTC, which is coordinated universal time. And it was as if it were originating from an unbound hyperbolic orbit with 99.999% confidence. The U.S. Department of Defense has since verified that the velocity estimate reported to NASA is sufficiently accurate to indicate an interstellar trajectory in this case, close quote. 
They learned that nine years ago on January 8, 2014, quote, a meteor lit up skies while traveling at more than 100,000 miles an hour, close quote, into the ocean waters surrounding Manus Island in Papua, New Guinea, 1,300 miles from Darwin, Northern Australia. The speed and angle in which the object plunged down through Earth's atmosphere could be interstellar debris that sank to the ocean floor. And so Professor Loeb and Amir Siraj wrote a paper for an astronomy journal hypothesizing that this Manus Island event was from an interstellar object. Their paper was not accepted, but U.S. Space Command must have been following Professor Loeb's efforts. On April 15, 2022, the New York Times headline, quote, Military memo deepens possible interstellar meteor mystery. The U.S. Space Command seemed to confirm a claim that a meteor from outside the solar system had entered Earth's atmosphere, but other scientists and NASA are still not convinced, close quote. The U.S. Space Command memo, dated March 1, 2022, is from John E. Shaw, Lieutenant General, U.S. Space Force, Deputy Commander in Department of Defense, U.S. Space Command, Peterson uh, Air, uh, Space Force Base in Colorado, 80914. Memorandum for NASA Science Mission Directorate Attention, Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen. The subject line is Confirmation of Interstellar Object, and the paragraph begins. As you are aware and may be aware, Dr. Amir Siraj and Dr. Abraham Loeb of the Department of Astronomy of Harvard University, quote, identified a meteor detected on 2014-18, January 1st, January 8th, 2014, at 17.05.34 UTC. The paper reported the meteor as originating from an unbound hyperbolic orbit. Defined as interstellar space hereafter, with a 9.999% 9, 9 confidence. This event would predate the discovery of a Muamua by about three years. Subsequently, Dr. Joel Moser, the Chief Scientist of Space Operations Command, the U.S. Space Force Service component of U.S. Space Command, confirmed that the velocity estimate reported to NASA is sufficiently accurate to indicate an interstellar trajectory, close quote. Here is Dr. Avi Loeb's comment to me about why he thinks the January 2014 Manus Island event in Papua New Guinea was interstellar. This object was moving so fast that even outside the solar system, it was moving at 60 kilometers per second, which is faster than 95% of all stars in the vicinity of the sun. So it was moving too fast to be bound to the sun. And then the government provided more data on the object. The object is actually tougher in material strength than all other space rocks in the catalog of NASA. So this object was unusual in two ways. One is high speed, but the second is material strength. Because of that, we thought maybe it's uh, artificial in origin, technological. Because if you imagine Voyager, our own spacecraft that is heading towards interstellar space, colliding with another planet in a billion years, it would appear as a meteor. Also, it would move faster than usual because it has propulsion. By July 5th, 2023... Professor Loeb had completed a $1.5 million expedition to Manus Island in Papua New Guinea with deep sea divers, and they lowered a sled covered with magnets down onto the ocean seabed to drag the magnets over the sea floor. And to the right of Professor Loeb is a photo of one of the 
approximately 50 golden marble or sphere. Uh, it's enlarged in this photo. They are very tiny spheres, only a millimeter or less and weigh less than a milligram. Another scientist who took notice of Professor Loeb's research was John Brandenburg, PhD, plasma physicist with Kepler Aerospace Limited in Midland, Texas, and author of a 2015 book about radioactivity in the Northern Hemisphere of Mars. The explosion John estimated to be the first of two hydrogen bombs over the Cydonia and D&M pyramid region where the big face on Mars is sculpted in the hill. The face is a rock formation on the surface of Mars resembling an enormous humanoid face staring straight up into space. It is about two and a half kilometers long by two kilometers wide and about 0.4 kilometers tall. It is located on a flat plain known as Cydonia Mensa in Mars Northern Hemisphere. The face and other objects described on this page were imaged by one of the Viking orbiters in the summer of 1976. After studying Professor Avi Loeb's magnetic dredging efforts near Manus Island in Papua New Guinea, John Brandenburg published this paper online in the September 30th, 2023 International Journal of Innovation Scientific Research and Review. The title is Interstellar Sample Analysis, a failed Project Orion type interstellar probe sent to investigate Earth? Question mark. Here now is John Brandenburg. Normally, a meteor that comes in and has a lot of iron in it also has a lot of nickel. So the first flag that this is an unusual sample is that it had almost no nickel in it. And even though it had more than the usual amount of iron relative to like silicon. So basically, they use the carbonaceous chondrite compositions as a yardstick, kind of as a measurement to see how strange is this thing that came falling in. And most meteorites fall right on this curve, abundance of elements. And what is it about these spherules that have provoked you and Avi and this paper to say that the fragment resembles the composition of a melt processed in a fragment of a former planetary molten core, but resembles the composition of a melt processed and partially burned sample of a high strength aerospace fragment of a melted and partially oxidized thermonuclear device. Yes, there's two elements that are very rare that are light. Hydrogen is of course the most abundant element. Helium is the next most abundant. And then the nuclear physics in stars skips over these other things that are lithium and beryllium. So they're both quite rare. They're concentrated on Earth by various chemical processes, some of which have to do with bacteria liking them, and they form deposits that are concentrated. Normally in a meteorite, you hardly find any lithium or beryllium. They're cosmologically very rare. Interestingly enough, carbon oxygen and nitrogen are the next most abundant elements. But there's this big chasm between helium and the abundance of helium and the abundance and hydrogen and the abundance of oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. And that chasm represents the lithium and beryllium, very rare elements. And so when they show up, that means that something is unusual. Yes, it means this is a very strange object because these are like a thousand times more concentrated in these sphere oils than you normally find in anything from an ordinary meteorite. These are not garden variety sphere oils at all. They're extremely unusual. The other things that are abundant in them, and unusually so, making this doubly strange, so you have the two light elements, beryllium and lithium, but you also have uranium and thorium, and those are components of nuclear bombs. And thorium was used heavily in the uh, Amchatka test up in Alaska when they set off a space nuclear warhead underground. 
at five megatons that caused a small earthquake in the Aleutians. And so those uranium and thorium are very rare in the cosmos, and so are beryllium and lithium. But uranium and thorium are, are rare because they're very heavy. Lithium and beryllium are rare because, interestingly enough, they're very light and they don't fit into the cosmic nuclear processes very well. So when you find those four things together in something, this is doubly strange. And this object was coming in so fast. It was coming from outer space. It was not some errant random missile. No, no, it was not. It was not a missile not a satellite, it was not a meteorite of any ordinary sort. It fell from interstellar space between the stars. The four elements, beryllium, lithium, uranium, and thorium, are components of hydrogen bombs. Right. That's the only place you find that combination of rare elements mixed together is in a hydrogen bomb. Or if you took a hydrogen bomb and melted it, and then had it break up in the atmosphere like it was a nuclear warhead coming in and melted and then ended up breaking up and showering into the ocean, then you would find steel. And you would probably find titanium and aluminum because those are both components of aerospace alloys. And you find a lot of that in these spherules. But then you find these four very rare elements all together. This is very odd. Well, it's very concerning. Because if it is consistent with a melted nuclear weapon, this is not an academic matter anymore. This is a matter of global security for the whole human race. Are there nuclear weapons out there on board spacecraft? And you've already raised that question in your death on Mars, having to do with hydrogen bombs in Mars in the Cydonia Northern Hemisphere region. Oh, oh yes. And I have presented now papers at the Ascend meeting of AIAA. People, they were stunned that I had found this. It explains the facts as we know them on Mars. There was apparently a thermonuclear holocaust on Mars involving hydrogen bombs. If they were hydrogen bombs, they were as big as the Empire State Building and dropped from space onto Mars. You're talking about the work that you have done on the Cydonia region in northern Mars. Yes. And that the significance to you in your mind between your Mars work and now the analysis on the New Guinea, the medal that Avi Loeb got, what does that set off in your own mind in terms of thinking about the universe that we're in and that there would be signatures of hydrogen bombs in the northern hemisphere of Mars and that there would be other signatures down in Papua of melted and oxidized thermal nuclear devices. Well, it says that we are not alone in the universe. And as above, so below. There is, just as there is good and evil on Earth, there is apparently good and evil in the rest of the cosmos. People learned how to build nuclear weapons from looking at the stars. That's how Einstein came up with E equals MC squared. They knew that the sun was producing all of this energy And it couldn't be explained by any chemical process. It had to be some other process, and he figured out what it was. It was conversion of mass into energy. And that's the same physics that occurs in a hydrogen bomb. And we had been watching for years that certain large stars, when they got old, the big stars, Linda, don't go out quietly. (laughs) Is this where the people who are upset by this report is that it automatically indicates the existence of nuclear weapons in this part of the Milky Way galaxy or beyond and beyond Earth. Yes, technology is out there just like it is on Earth. The same laws of physics are present elsewhere in the universe, and there are also intelligent beings who have discovered them and able to employ them. This is very disturbing to some people, But also, it should be actually expected. If we begin with the premise that we are not alone in the universe, there are other intelligent beings out there in the stars, which is a scientific certainty in my viewpoint. Yes. 
there's abundant evidence to indicate that the Earth and its people, its biosphere, are not unique in the cosmos. So there are other people out there, and they have also mastered space travel. In fact, they're even more advanced technologically than us. They've probably been around longer than us, much longer. Right. And they have nuclear weapons technology, which anyone who develops space travel and looks at the stars can figure out. There have been extraterrestrial Einsteins out there. And that doesn't mean that they mean us any harm. It does, however, mean that space, the stars are a realm of conflict between good and evil, just like we have on Earth. So that means only three interstellar objects known to humanity ever as of now. But I think for all of you, I know I feel this way, that we're not alone in this universe and that coming in the future could be a whole lot of interstellar objects and events just waiting to unfold when we are finally released from the strange classified reality that we are alone when we are not. So interstellar to Earth, it is a grand, huge mystery. And I'm glad that we are able to talk about these subjects uh, on Wednesday nights. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, we keep growing and that I've had a lot of you ask me about upcoming conferences and appearances. And if there are any updates on Interstellar or anything else, um, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you in Los Angeles at the LAX Hilton. And that is for Conscious Life Expo, uh, which is uh, the February 9 to 13 in the new year of 2024. And then uh, the Sedona Ascension Retreat in Sedona in March, March 8 to 10, 2024. And um, they're going to be fun. I hope I get to see a lot of you there. And you can keep track of uh, conferences and appearances in my schedule by going to my earthfiles.com news website and click on conferences and appearances. And uh, we'll have details in there for all of you. So with that, as we are getting closer and closer and closer to the end of 2023, and with a sense that I think is coming to me from people who are working in, we'll say, classified areas, uh, 2024 could be one heck of a year. And uh, I want to urge everyone who feels like I do, when you concentrate on positive, when you concentrate on light, I think that you can help shift away from the dark. And let's hope it seems like it could be from the vantage point at the end of 2023. And with that, dear Ian, in England, what have you got on your mind now and list about comments and questions from the audience tonight? Well, I'm back um, from Las Vegas, Linda, where I was uh, pleased to see that you are honored with the um, Lifetime Achievement Award at the Stairway to the Sky. Thank you. And uh, Disclosure Fest. Yes, and, um, and I was here because my brother has been quite ill. That's right. So um, well, you were well missed in, um, in uh, Las Vegas, but everyone was understanding. And, uh, and they sent you their love, and they also sent Thank prayers you. to your brother, too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So today, first of all, I want to kick off with uh, last week. You featured a photograph showing um, a white tech uh, UFO on the back of a, um, of a vehicle. Uh, someone in the audience, Austin Morris 981, says, the pod of 1947 resembles the white egg-shaped UFO reported by patrolman Lonnie Zamara in April 1964 at Socorro, New Mexico. It also resembles the egg-shaped object reported by Jose Padilla and Rene Baca, which they witnessed near the new, uh, the northwest boundary of the White Sands Proving Ground in August 1945. Can you comment on that, on, on this actual object, and perhaps any link with the object, and whether or not uh, the object seen in Socorro was some sort of escape pod? 
the information with the photo came to me as, Linda, this is genuine. No matter what anybody else says, this is genuine. And they um, wanted me to see something that was different from what has been port portrayed in the past, meaning a smaller pod. What I'm lacking, and when I was at the photograph was delivered, um, there was some communication about uh, the provenance and uh, everything and what exactly is this. And, and the source said, I will get you more information in the future. I just wanted you to see what these pods were. And apparently, according to this person, the pod would be found inside or outside of a larger craft. And in this particular one, it was described to me that there were two beings inside of that pod, called a pod just to have a name that they could attach to something that was not the craft that was moving in the sky, but was a component inside, attached somehow, and in it were two bodies as I understand, and that they were in the what we'll call the gray category, which is becoming more and more and more detailed and broken down as they all are the more we learn. So my frustration is, and it is with a lot of the sources as well, they agree with me that we are uh, living in a whole planet and where we have been denied the truth for millennia about our being in a universe with a lot of other life and consciousness. And that some of it was coming and going during World War II, for sure, and continuing in what? One of the states that was one of the most important players, Trinity Site, Los Alamos, Kirtland, and the development of the first atomic bomb and the test. And the fact that there would have been interest in the state of New Mexico by extraterrestrials, whether biological entity grays or Nordics or tall whites or teals or a variety of reptilians or the list now in 2023 goes on and on. It's, there's so many. I would like, if anybody watching and I understand from some of the communications that some people, even from JSOC, watch Wednesday shows. So I would be grateful for more verification that would hold up as evidentiary about exactly what is happening in that photograph that I have showed you a couple of weeks ago and the, about the pod uh, and or and or pods. I have also had other information that there could have been two pods. And to get information by proton mail or uh, proton or I guess FedEx, the safest. And uh, that's the one thing that encourages me is that I open up subjects here, and by the next Wednesday or two Wednesdays, I have information that in some cases I've been able to check out. And this is, to me, this is valuable. This is a good way to help communicate with you, me, develop other sources, other information. And that the people who want to throw cold water on these baby steps of people working in JSOC and other agencies uh, trying to share whatever they can, you should have been in my shoes for the last 44 years. <laughs> it's very, I can't imagine taking on a more difficult subject and trying to get truth, absolute truth with evidence than what I have been through since beginning animal mutilations with and so many people don't seem to absorb 
that the animal mutilations in 1979 were being investigated by veterinarians with law enforcement. I was able to confirm that the excisions of many, many of the animals that I investigated were done with something that cooked the hemoglobin and the collagen, but it didn't leave carbon residue. And the list of evidentiary pieces that go on are in my books, in my documentaries, in the <laughs> more than 3,000 or whatever it is now of the interviews that I have done, earthfiles.com. It, it really is a gigantic subject in which people have been paid for decades to convince everybody on earth that there is absolutely nothing to these subjects that are so, so important. So thank you, Ian, and thank you, everybody, and let's go on to another subject. Christian Alexander says, <laughs> haven't our scientists talked about using nuclear weapons in the atmosphere of Mars to kickstart terraforming? Could Martians have been trying to restart their own dying environment? Uh, it, it's hard to know. Uh, I, my perspective right now on November 15th, 2023, my honest perspective, and sorry for a scratchy throat, I hope, I'm, I think I'm fending off a cold. Um, when the re, an absolutely real seeing ID, Defense Intelligence Agency analyst in December of 1999, talked with me with a man from the World Bank for seven hours and started with, Linda, our government has proof that going back to, he said 270 million, it's been refined for me in the last year or two by people who have other information that it's 278 million years. I still do not have the data that fills in the blank. Well, what was it specifically 278 million years ago that was the beginning of these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA and already evolving primates to create Homo sapiens? That's the, that was the bottom line sentence in the document that I read in 1983 at Kirtland when I was working on the HBO project. Uh, word, other words in an, another document were all questions and mysteries about the evolution of humans on this planet. In fact, it used Homo sapien again. Of Homo sapien on this planet have been answered and this project is closed. Those have been the themes. And that when that DIA analyst told me in December of 1999, a huge story, and I've, I've mentioned pieces of it here, that the role of extraterrestrial biological intelligences in the experimentation and creation of life forms on this earth has been going on, as he said, for at least 270 million years, and that there are three competing among many, many, many different species of intelligences. The main three camps working earth, so to speak, with genetic manipulation have been the Nordics, have been the Greys, and have been reptilians. Uh, the tall whites in the last year or two have been included in discussions confidential with people saying that the tall whites are spiritual. They do, I think the, the word is honor, they honor life forms. They honor the whole cyclic process of an evolution of life. That they don't want to see life destroyed 
and that they are not destroyers of life, but they aren't going to come into our planet or another planet and say, we're here, we know how to do all this and more, and take over. That is not going to happen with the tall whites. So in a strange way, I guess, that's a little bit of good news because that means they're powerful and everybody has told me they are trying to guide us indirectly, protect us indirectly, and then that the Nordics might intervene and be involved much more directly because you can't tell, as I understand it from several sources, you cannot tell from the whole Norwegian group of uh, the world. You cannot tell most Norwegians from any of the so-called Nordic extraterrestrials. They all fit and blend in. Raising the interesting question always, who is the progenitor? Who is the original antecedent to the humanoids of which Homo sapiens sapien is one of the experiments in creation? And these are the subjects that I am trying uh, actively to learn a lot more about and hopefully getting evidentiary material. And if I have evidentiary material, I'll report it here. That's a promise. Okay, Ian. Okay, Mark K says, Linda, what do you think Abura Mora could be? Well, I confess that within two months of that September blasting out of here, where they had the illustration of how it spiraled in and then at one speed and then was going out at this tremendous speed, which implied, and I think Avi Loeb uh, is convinced that there was acceleration, that this was either some sort of a drone, a probe, something on purpose that came through here, disguised, camouflaged with that so-called rocky coating, but that in the rocky coating was a rectangular kind of shape. I think that Avi Loeb senses or feels that this could very well have been uh, a manned or unmanned visitor to check something out or that there somebody else is involved in a project having to do with Earth. But there was another person who was in the military who uh, saw my Earth Files report on Oumuamua and eventually uh, communicated with me through a confidential method and said, just want you to know that I know for a fact, because I know the people who did this research work, we sent out some kind of a craft, uh, whether it was manned uh, space force or unmanned drone ex that we have to go out and check things in our solar system. And that the, the person said, I can tell you, this was definitely involved with current intelligence that is monitoring us and our solar system. So these pieces keep coming together that things are occurring that might fit into the category that we are finally at a stage where reality will be finally declassified and will be told the truth. That we're not alone in this universe is teeming with life and consciousness. And why do some interact up to a point, but we are never introduced formally to other life forms that are using our Earth, doing genetic experiments, harvesting metals throughout our solar system. So, there's an impatience among these people that have watched something that I've done and then have said, and here you need to know XXX. And I try to be very careful in honoring their request for 
confidentiality and uh, anonymity. So that makes this job much harder because I try to tell you as much as I can, but I am all always holding back. And, and so are the people who share the information, like getting the photograph without evidentiary material that would surround and support exactly what happened, exactly what date, what time, what exactly is the pod, what exactly was in it, all of those questions we all need to know before we're moving on to this new landscape where we should be able to have rich and detailed information and not someone saying, you all can't handle it, which has been the attitude. <laughs> okay, Ian. Uh, just in time, 143 says, what does Linda think about the recent news that Sean Kirkpatrick is leaving AARO? Uh, this follows the news that he told Politico that he had deferred his planned retirement last year to take on the job atop uh, AARO and now feels he has achieved his goals and says he's ready to move on. He's accomplished everything that he said he was going to do. I think the correct word is fired. I think Sean Kirkpatrick was fired. But the irony, the huge irony in all of this is if it's true that he was fired because 24 hours before he was asked to leave his job, that it was over his making a statement in a podcast, I believe, saying that, yes, there might really be evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence in this universe. And the irony, uh, after Grush appeared before uh, Congressman Burchett's committee in the summer and with the two pilots, it was within, uh, I think it was within 24 hours then that it was Sean Kirkpatrick, the new director of the Aero office in the Pentagon, who told people in the media, uh, don't pay any attention to David Grush, uh, nothing he's saying is true, and that he said uh, in straight words the opposite of what was behind this new firing. Uh, he, he said that there was no evidence at all of any extraterrestrial intelligence interacting with the Earth. So back in the summer, at the time of the House subcommittee hearing, on UFOs, UAPs. It was Sean Kirkpatrick who said, no, 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 don't, don't pay any attention to David Grush or to Fravor or uh, Ryan Graves. No, no. And now, uh, in the, I guess it was right at the beginning of November, end of October, I don't have the date in front of me, he gets fired and in the media, it says it was over his finally making a statement to somebody who was doing a podcast or news that there just might be real evidence of extraterrestrials. So how many ways uh, do these guys want to cover and cut this up? The truth, the, the straight out truth. <laughs> there are trillions of stars in this universe. And this may not be the only universe. And that we already know, we have known since at least World War II, officially, that there were other intelligences interacting on this planet during World War II. Hitler talked about the extraterrestrials from Aldebaran. It wasn't a joke, it was real. And now we're in almost to 2024, and we have finally been hearing some straight talk from pilots, intel. But with every step forward, if you said, what seems to be the strategy currently? One step forward with truth, six back with, I'll just, I started to say lies, that sound, 
harsh. They would say calculated counterintelligence because they want to control the reins on how rapidly or not so rapidly the truth comes out. We're in Kabuki theater. We are all being controlled by people who have all kinds of meetings and interactions with extraterrestrial biological entities and are worried, are truly worried about the insect population and Epsilon Eridani, only 10 and a half light years from Earth, that Ronald Reagan did have a briefing about March 6th to 8th, 1981, that he was warned strenuously about the name Tranta Lloyd, T-R-A-N-T-A-L-O-I-D, Tranta Lloyd or Tranta Lloyd's plural with an S. I was told at least three years ago, because I had done a story about the Reagan, a briefing. They said, you need to have a little, one little slice that if you do some digging, you'll be able to confirm. Those five names pre presented to Ronald Reagan were five names that were put together by a biochemist named Emmett Chappelle working at NASA Goddard. He passed away. But when you read about Emmett Chappelle and the work that he did and that he was involved in uh, investigations, the studies of, the details of extraterrestrial life in this planet, the solar system and beyond. And it's true. And so we're still at that effort where we're trying to get every, all the doors open, all the windows open, and tell the whole, whole unbelievable centuries of a different truth than what humans have been allowed. But at a bigger box, if you go to the biggest box, consciousness, the thought that dwells in the light, who has created this universe, if it is one of many that are created under advanced intelligence for experimentation. If you go to that huge box that they must also interact with, the thought that dwells in the light. It seems to me that if we can move out into at least getting this planet on a square of truth, that it has to go with educating everybody about the physics of frequencies, resonances, what is actually happening at a subatomic level, what is happening at the matter level, what is happening at light frequencies, that the advanced beings know how to control. Until we're all sort of on the same level and understanding with the universe, it's always going to be difficult for at least humanity to keep evolving as a species toward more deep understanding about everything that might then lift up the whole population of Homo sapien. And until that happens, until we're actually on a planet where all of the realities of the universe, everything from black holes and frequencies and how they play and what is happening and, and why the experimentation with humanoid life we are somehow vulnerable. And I'd like to see us grow and be strong and walking with that thought that dwells in the light at all times. Okay, Eric, uh, Ian. Yeah, Linda, let me just do the super chats this evening to acknowledge our generous audience here today. Um, by the way, we've got people checking in from all around the world. Um, you remember the last time we did a quick check, we, we found out that we had had, um, I think, 56 different countries in the last
last yeah. Uh, month. Yeah. Well, and uh, 160 different countries in total have contacted their files. We've got people oh. from Sweden, Canada, you know, all over the United States, Iceland, Norway, New Zealand, Australia again, and uh, Nicaragua and the Philippines are here tonight. Oh, I am so glad. So we are at about 160 countries now uh, as we are ending up in or going into November, December. We're at well, least... In, yes, in total, 116 different countries have... have um, I'm so have glad. So here we go. Moonbird. Hi. Hi, Moonbird. Joseph Anthony, who says, thanks for keeping us updated on the esoteric. Uh, Mary Goff is here. Captain Kurt, Jude, Terry to Jerry Tobias, Yin Yang Glow, and she sends prayers as well for your brother. Leapview.com you. and Vividian G. And I've got an experience from Mary Goff. She says, I had hundreds of contact abduction experiences from 1991 to 1995. And, and yes, that was a very busy time for abductions. I had time spent with them. Kim Carlsberg at the Las Vegas event, and she'd even written that book, uh, Beyond My Wildest Dreams. But Mary Goff says her experiences were spiritual and positive. She's so glad she was not associated with negative entities. Um, but she says, if anyone else has had abduction experiences, did you have issues with lights and electricity afterwards? I'd walk down the street at night, and street lights would go out one after another as I'd approach. She also says that she had tones um, that would play on her answer phone uh, when the events took place between 2.30 and 4.30 in the morning. I have heard before, by half a dozen people at least, uh, going all the way back to the 79, 80 time period when I was still at the CBS station in Denver and working on what would become a strange harvest. And there were uh, several reports of people saying, if I walk down a street at 2 a.m. and it's, it's empty and people are not there in cars, the lights will go on. And other people have said that they could only have, the, they would only notice that the lights would go on when they pass them under certain circumstances. And there are so many qualifiers like that when it comes to interacting with technologies by the ETs because they are definitely on assignments they are definitely involved with studying us, interacting with us, harvesting sperm and genetic material and eggs from us. And so the idea that at least half a dozen people that I have talked to personally in the last 44 years have said the same thing. They, they were abductees, that's why they were talking to me. And they had had interactions with different types. They, I, I remember that mostly were greys, but there was one person, I think, that had an interaction with the Nordics. None, to my knowledge, with tall whites. Uh, I don't think that the tall whites have been abductors. Uh, if, they, if there's somebody here tonight who has contradictory information, please get in touch with me about that. But what I'm coming to is there are certain categories of, we used to call it high strangeness, associated in any human's life who was having an interaction on some kind of a regular basis with non-humans. And it would be something like this. They would notice that there were interactions with electrical outlets. It would either stop them or this walking down the street and having lights come on as they passed it comes back to the same word, frequency, or plural, frequencies. We are babies because we've been kept in babyhood about the physics and the relationship of other intelligences, perhaps for a positive reason, but to keep going on this planet through 2024 and beyond, without humanity as a whole being told all of the truths, good, bad, and ugly, and beautiful, because it's all there, all of it. I think we are hurt by it. I think we are weakened, and we need to be strengthened in our 
positive frequencies. We need to be strengthened in our link between our soul frequency and the thought that dwells in the light frequency. At that level, at that huge, incredible level, everything that we think of as high strangeness may have even been efforts to make us individually and on our own curious enough to start reaching out toward the unknown. And that to me is where we are in 2023. And that I am praying, praying, praying that war and violence will finally end. And I just wish that we wouldn't be being put on hold as if we can't introduce the ETs until we're all through with wars, until we're all through with uh, creating our own space base on Mars and in various places. We shouldn't be held up, I don't think. We need to be strengthened and, edu and educated about all of this, and that's what I try to do. So, even though I can't fill in all the details, I'm trying to learn as many details as I possibly can. And that the truth is, and you all know, we are not alone in this universe and we never have been. And we are at an extraordinary intersection in which I hope we're going to be allowed to go across that intersection and start learning about everything there is to learn that scientists and intel people already are deeply in. Let's open up Earth, maybe opening up Earth to shocking revelations, might, might slow down and stop violence among human beings. We shouldn't have violence among human beings. We should look at each other and recognize that we are incredible beings with souls on this planet. And in that agape hug, I'll see you guys next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions them. will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>